Welcome everyone. During this lecture, we'll introduce the definition of force, Newton's first law of motion, Newton's second law of motion, we'll define inertia, we'll introduce the force units, and we'll also discuss a basic application of Newton's second law. Let's begin with the definition of force. Force is a measure of the push or pull that is applied to an object. So anytime you're pushing or pulling, you are applying a force. The symbol for force is capital F, and it's important to note that force is a vector quantity because the direction of the force matters. And so we'll introduce an arrow on top of this capital F, and we'll also be discussing the units for force a little bit later in our lecture. Let's consider a lawnmower in our backyard. In order to mow the lawn, of course, we have to push the lawnmower. And by pushing the lawnmower, we are applying a force represented by this arrow. We can label that force as F1. It's also important to consider the interaction between the ground and the lawnmower's wheels. The ground also exerts a push and it's directed upward. We can represent the ground's push on the rear wheels through F2 and the ground's push on the front wheels can be represented by F3. Let's introduce Newton's first law of motion. Newton observed that an object at rest tends to remain at rest. In other words, the lawnmower that we just considered was at rest in our backyard. That lawnmower will just remain at rest indefinitely if there's no push or pull that's applied to it. In other words, the lawnmower won't just magically start to move. Newton also noted that an object in motion tends to maintain its motion and that's somewhat counterintuitive our experience suggests that when we throw a ball in other words set it into motion that ball will eventually come to rest the reason the ball comes to rest is that it eventually interacts with the ground it lands on the ground the ground then exerts a push against the ball and that push is what brings the ball to rest. On the other hand, if we were to throw the same ball in outer space away from the influence of other objects such as planets and stars, that ball will just continue to move indefinitely. If we throw it at 90 miles an hour in space, it would maintain a 90 mile an hour velocity indefinitely. The only way to change that motion is by applying an external force to the object. And Newton noted that variation within his first law by stating that an object in motion tends to maintain its motion unless acted upon 
by a non-zero net external force. If we consider an air hockey table that's perfectly level and 10 miles in length, let's say, Newton's law tells us that under ideal conditions, if we set a puck into motion at one end of the table, that puck would maintain its motion until it reached the other end. In other words, its speed would not increase and it wouldn't decrease. Let's now consider the Earth's revolution about the Sun. The Earth revolves about the Sun at roughly 67,000 miles per hour and that speed of revolution is for the most part unaffected because we have no significant external forces that are interfering with the Earth's revolution and so the Earth maintains its motion about the Sun. The Earth also rotates at roughly 1,040 miles per hour and because again we, there are no significant forces that are affecting that rotation the Earth's rotation remains for the most part unaffected. We will now introduce Newton's second law of motion. Newton observed that when an object is acted upon by a non-zero net external force that object will experience an acceleration. In other words, acceleration implies that the object's motion will change. Its speed will no longer be constant. Or if the object is at rest, that net external force will cause it to accelerate. And of course, the acceleration means that the object will be set into motion. Newton observed that the acceleration will be directly proportional to the applied force In other words, the greater the magnitude of the force, the more acceleration there will be. But Newton also noted that there's an inverse relationship. He stated that it would be inversely proportional to the object's mass. In other words, the more massive the object is, the less the value of the acceleration. Newton reduced this observation into two equations. When one force is applied, Newton noted that it the relationship looks like this. That force will equal the mass of the object times the resulting acceleration. On the other hand, when more than one force is applied, or when two or more forces are applied, 
Newton noted that we have to sum all of those forces. We have to add them up in a vector sense. He noted that with the Greek letter sigma, which notes summation, and after we add all the forces using vector analysis, and I want to emphasize that, that resulting force will equal the mass times the acceleration. And let's also note that this Greek letter sigma means we must use vector analysis to determine the sum of all external forces. We will now introduce the units for force. And we'll start by observing this relationship. For one force, we wrote that F equals MA. The units for mass in the international system are kilograms. And for acceleration, we use meters per second squared. And this would have been the unit. In other words, a kilogram meter per second squared would have been the unit for force. However, the scientific community decided to honor Newton by defining a kilogram meter per second squared as 1 Newton. So again, a Newton is a unit of force. It's the international system unit for force. And it equates with a kilogram meter per second squared. And so we can define a Newton as follows. A Newton is the amount of force required to accelerate a mass of one kilogram at a rate of one meter per second squared. We can represent this graphically by imagining let's say a one kilogram ball in outer space. So we're in outer space we have a one kilogram baseball and we're going to push it with a force of one Newton. Newton tells us that this object will then accelerate at a rate of one meter per second squared and we will show the acceleration using this arrow throughout the course. And note again that that acceleration will equal one meter per second squared. The question is how hard do we have to push? In other words, how much push amounts to one Newton? We'll answer that question in just a bit, but first I would like to introduce the British unit for force. Again, we'll rely on this relationship, F equals MA for one force, and we'll note that in the British system, the unit for mass, if you recall, is the slug, and the unit for acceleration is the foot per second squared. And there is a name that is defined as a slug foot per second squared. In our system, we define a slug foot per second squared as one pound.
Now we're familiar with the concept of a pound and we'll develop that concept further in just a little while. We also are aware of how much push is involved with the concept of a pound. So what is the relationship between a pound of push versus a newton of push? And I like to relate those two through this figure. Now if you're wondering what this is, I might have to explain. This is a quarter pounder. And the reason I'm using a quarter pounder is this hamburger is approximately one newton in weight. And I introduced the word weight because weight, as we'll find out in just a little while, is also a unit of force. So one quarter pound is approximately equal to one newton, but not exactly. The exact relationship looks like this. One newton equals exactly 0.2248 pounds. Let's introduce the concept of inertia. Newton noted that if we have, let's say, a ping pong ball versus a bowling ball, and we apply the same force to both of them, we'll call those forces F. The ping pong ball will experience a much higher acceleration than the bowling ball. In other words, the bowling ball will tend to resist our attempt to change its state of motion. The ping pong ball will resist our attempt as well, but to a lesser extent. Newton defined this resistance as an object's inertia, and it turns out that this inertia is directly related to the object's mass. From that, we can define inertia. Inertia is a measure of an object's resistance to changes in its state of motion. This resistance is directly proportional to the object's mass. It's important to note that the object doesn't resist motion, it resists changes to its motion. So if the bowling ball is at rest, it will resist our attempt to create motion. On the other hand, if the, if the bowling ball is in motion, it will resist our attempt to try to stop its motion. We will now introduce two applications of Newton's second law. In the first application, an automobile with a mass of 1,500 kilograms experiences a net forward force of 9,500 newtons. If the automobile starts from rest, determine the magnitude of its acceleration, as well as the time when the automobile reaches a speed of 65 miles per hour. Now, in order for this automobile to experience a horizontal acceleration, there must be an external force 
directed horizontally that's causing this acceleration. Now, if you're considering the force of the engine, that would be inappropriate because the engine is creating internal forces. Newton emphasized that the forces must be external. And so the force that's causing the car to accelerate is actually the force between the road and the wheels of the automobile. That force is called friction, and we'll discuss that thoroughly later on in our lectures. We'll introduce that force as F, and note that this force F is what is causing the car to accelerate. Now, the engine, of course, does play a role. It actually compels the production of this force F, and we'll get into greater detail uh, regarding friction later on in our course. But let's, for now, agree that this is the force that causes the car to accelerate, and we'll also indicate that the car is accelerating with an open arrow. The car's mass is noted as 1,500 kilograms. There's only one accelerating force in the direction of motion, and so we can apply Newton's second law as follows. Now we will enter the values for force. The force equals 9,500. The mass is 1,500. And we need to solve for the acceleration. If we just divide both sides by 1,500, the acceleration turns out to equal 6.333. And of course, the units are meters per second squared. In part B, we want to determine the time when the automobile reaches a speed of 65 miles per hour. And we also want to note that the automobile started its travel from rest. Well, the first issue that we have to address is the fact that 65 miles per hour is incompatible with the international system, right? The force is given in SI units, 9,500 newtons. The mass is given in kilograms. Of course, miles per hour are part of the British system. And so the first thing we have to do is to convert the 65 miles per hour into the appropriate units, which are meters per second. Let's perform this conversion. We're seeking units of meters per second, and we're starting out with 65 miles per hour. Our textbook has a conversion between miles and kilometers. Let's introduce that. It states that one mile equals 1.609 kilometers. We also know that one kilometer equals 1,000 meters. The kilometers cancels, the miles cancel, and we're ending up with meters per hour. Now, of course, we have to convert the hours to seconds. We can do that by noting that one hour equals 60 minutes, and, of course, one minute equals 60 seconds. Notice that we have the cancellations that we're looking for. And the surviving units are meters per second. Now, if we multiply all the factors in the numerator, and then divide by 60 once and divide by 60 again, we will get the following result. 
29.05 meters per second. And that is the final velocity of the car, which is noted as V in our motion in one dimension equations. So the final velocity is 29.05 meters per second. The car started from rest, and so the initial velocity, which of course is noted as V0, equals zero and now we have to open up our 1D motion equations and find an equation that solves for the time. Here are the equations from lecture number two and now we need to find an equation that will solve for time. Keep in mind we have V known, we have the V0 equaling zero and we also determine the acceleration. Let's take a look at the first equation we have V, we have V0, and we also have the acceleration. This equation will be used to solve for time. So let's introduce it. V equals V0 plus AT. V, of course, equals 29.05. We started out with an initial velocity of 0. The acceleration equaled 6.333. times time. And we now need to divide both sides by 6.333. And if we do that, we obtain a value of 4.587 seconds. We will now introduce a second application. In this application, the automobile from the example above requires 10 seconds to come to rest from a speed of 65 miles per hour after the driver applies the brakes. Determine the magnitude of the automobile's acceleration as well as the magnitude of the net force acting upon the automobile. So essentially we're entering another phase. We reached a speed of 65 miles per hour in the earlier example. We're applying the brakes and we're bringing the car to rest. And so we are now experiencing a deceleration. To find that deceleration, which is essentially a negative acceleration, let's take inventory of what we know. So again, we want to find the acceleration. And here's what is known. The automobile requires 10 seconds to come to rest. That gives us two variables. The time equals 10 seconds and the automobile comes to rest means that its final velocity equals zero. We started at a speed of 65 miles per hour. That is, of course, the initial velocity, and we already converted the 65 miles per hour. Let's take a look. That conversion resulted in a velocity of 29.05 meters per second, so let's bring that into our problem. So the initial velocity equals 29.05 meters per second. Again, that is just the conversion of the 65 miles per hour. Now, we have the time known, the velocity is known, the initial velocity is known. We need to find the acceleration. Let's take a look at our equation box again. Here it is, and it looks like we can use the same equation to solve this problem as we used earlier. We know the final velocity is zero. We determine the initial velocity, right? The initial velocity in the second phase just equals the final velocity from the first phase. We're looking for acceleration and we know the time. So let's use this equation. Here it is. V equals V0 plus AT. The velocity, again, 29.05. That's, of course, the initial velocity. The final velocity is zero. And the time equals 12, 10 seconds. Let's bring the 29.05 to the other side. That makes it negative. We have 10A on the right. And if we divide both sides by 10, we note that the acceleration is 
equals negative 2.905 meters per second squared and the negative means that we are slowing down the cars in fact decelerating which is consistent with the fact that we're applying the brakes so let's note that again the negative means the car is slowing down in part B we would like to determine the magnitude of the net force acting upon the automobile that's the braking force that we're finding we're assuming that there's a single force acting on the automobile during this second phase and because of that we can apply Newton's second law for a single force which looks like this the mass of the car is 1500 kilograms the acceleration we just calculated equals 2.905 and if we multiply them together we get the following result 4358 and of course the units for force are newtons we also want to note the negative sign in front which means that the force is in this case opposing the motion and we'll include that observation in our notes And that concludes our lecture.